Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. I had the chance to test the Z8 for the last month and I've also made an in-depth comparison of this camera with the Z7 Mark II and the Sony A1. You can find both of these comprehensive comparisons on my website, the links are in the description. This video is more of a summary of everything I've learned about the Nikon Z8. So let's begin. The Z8 is larger than most mirrorless cameras in this category. To be honest, it immediately reminded me of my old Nikon D700 DSLR. I realize not everybody will appreciate the larger body design, but what I can tell you is that when you use large lenses, the comfort with the Z8 goes to another level. You can see here the extra room my fingers have compared to the Z7 Mark II and the Sony A1. With the latter, I need to squeeze my fingers more and it can become uncomfortable after a while. Of course, the Z8 has weather resistance and feels very well built. I've only used the camera for three weeks and I haven't had any issues with it. However, it's important to mention that Nikon has issued two official recalls for the Z8, one related to the mount and another concerning the straps eyelets. I'll leave a link in the description where you can find more information about these recalls and check if your Z8 is affected or not. The ergonomics are fantastic and the camera is very enjoyable to use. There's a good amount of customization available, along with a handy LCD screen at the top, a convenient photo video switch, and a multitude of buttons around the body. What's even better is that many of these buttons are back illuminated. In terms of connectivity, here's what you get with the Z8. It's interesting to note that there are two USB-C ports, one for quick file transfer and a second one for power delivery. Additionally, you can use two memory cards. The first one can be a CFexpress Type-B or XQD card, and the second one can be a SD UHS-2 card. One thing to know with the Z8 is that you cannot backup video on the second card. It won't record in relay either, meaning it won't switch automatically to the second slot when the first is full. That is just for video though. Battery life is very good. Two hours at the Red Kite feeding station allowed me to capture almost 6,000 images and various 8K 60p and 4K 120p video clips, and the battery was at 51% when I left. Nikon included the same viewfinder in the Z8 as found on the flagship Z9. The specs may not be impressive for a camera in 2023, but they are consistent. And what I mean is that, for example, the resolution remains the same regardless of the frame rate you select. The viewfinder can reproduce excellent brightness and tonal range, and it's comfortable for those wearing glasses. At the rear, the Nikon features a large LCD screen with excellent resolution and a four-axis articulation that allows you to tilt it up when walking in a vertical orientation. The monitor is also touch-sensitive, allowing you to perform various functions, including navigating the menu. The Z8 features a full-frame sensor with 45.7 megapixel and no low-pass filter. It shares the same resolution as the Z7 Mark II and I can tell you right away that the image quality is identical between the two Nikon cameras. The main difference is that the Z8 sensor has a stacked design to improve readout speed, and we'll see the benefits of that later on. In this chapter, I'll show you how the Z8 compares to the Sony A1, which also has a full-frame stacked sensor, no low-pass filter, but sports 50.1 megapixel and a BSI design. First, we have the sharpness test using each brand's respective Pro Standard zoom lenses. Needless to say, they both meet expectations. If we enlarge these images significantly, we can notice slightly more moiré on the Z8. Next, we have the dynamic range, and my test shows very similar results when it comes to shadow recovery. With a severe adjustment of four stops, the A1 shows a bit more noise, especially on the blue coat, whereas the Z8 exhibits a slight color cast, but overall the results look pretty good. However, when it comes to highlights recovery capabilities, 
the A1 has a clear advantage and preserves more information outside the window. The ISO range is slightly different, with the Z8 starting with a lower base value. Both cameras perform well up to 1600 ISO with a minimum amount of noise. The images also look good at 3200 and 6400 ISO, beyond which noise becomes more pronounced. That said, up to 25600 ISO, they're not terrible if you really need that level of sensitivity. The higher extended values are less appealing as expected. Next, we can examine colors with straight out of the camera JPEGs. Starting with a landscape scene, the Z8 produces an overall warmer look but loses some of the blue tones in the water, which makes it appear slightly less realistic to my eyes. Moving on to a portrait example, the Sony has slightly more red and magenta in the standard profile. With the portrait setting, the Z8 renders softer contrast and softer red tones. Finally, in the neutral profile, the A1 has less saturation. The Nikon Z8 is shutterless, and what I mean by that is that there are no mechanical curtains opening and closing in front of the sensor when taking pictures. The camera works with the electronic shutter exclusively, just like the flagship Z9. The only mechanical curtain you will find inside the Nikon is a sensor shield, which comes down when you turn off the camera to protect the sensor when changing lenses. It is thicker and more robust than the standard mechanical curtains. The good news is that in most cases, the electronic shutter on the Z8 is plenty enough. Thanks to the stack design, the sensor readout is very fast and, for example, it can be used in mixed artificial light situations without banding issues. It's so fast that even panning quickly results in very contained distortion and you can see here how rolling shutter compares against the Sony A1. The electronic shutter also allows the Z8 to work at impressive continuous shooting speeds, as we'll discover in a minute, and go all the way up to a shutter speed of 1 thousand of a second. Last but not least, the Z8 is capable of working with live view and no blackouts. Whether you're working in single or continuous shooting mode, there is no lag, no blackouts, nothing that interrupts or delays the view in the viewfinder or LCD screen. The Sony one is capable of all that that I just explained, but there is one area where I found the Z8 to have an advantage, high-speed sync with flash. I tested the two cameras with my Profoto A10 and the Nikon was able to handle the fastest speed available without any problem. The A1, on the other hand, shows a bit of banding with the same settings. I can highlight this further by increasing the contrast on the two images. Basically, this means that the Z8 sensor readout is a bit faster than the one on the Sony. Alpha 1 photographers can use the mechanical shutter, although it is only the electronic first curtain shutter and not the full mechanical shutter, and in this specific case, it doesn't help at all. That said, the A1 has one advantage, and that is the standard sync speed with flash, which is faster than the Z8, thanks to the presence of the electronic first curtain shutter. We've mentioned speed quite a lot already, so let's talk about continuous shooting. The Z8 can go up to 120 frames per second, but the different speeds available come with a few limitations concerning either the image file, the resolution, and or the sensor area. By comparison, the Sony A1 goes up to 30 frames per second only, but it can do 30 frames per second with compressed RAW. One additional feature you will find on the Z8 is the pre-release capture mode which allows you to load frames in the camera's buffer memory before you fully press the shutter release button. It is very useful when you're waiting for an action or a movement that is difficult to anticipate. It works with all the speeds described earlier, and you can also specify the number of frames before and after the button is fully pressed. Next, we have the buffer test. As expected, the results are better when using a CFexpress card, 
The Z8 can work at 20 frames per second for almost 4 seconds using lossless compressed RAW. The performance improves when choosing high efficiency RAW, and with JPEGs at 20 frames per second, the camera doesn't slow down. At 30 frames per second and above, the buffer is pretty good, but then the Z8 stops entirely rather than continuing at a slower pace. The Z8 features a hybrid autofocus system with 120 AF calculations per second and comes with advanced subject detection algorithms. It can recognize people, animals, birds, various vehicles, trains, and airplanes. In my first autofocus test with a human subject, the Z8 delivers a good keeper rate of 84%. What impressed me the most is how quick the camera gets the eye in focus when the face of the person becomes visible again. On the downside, it does struggle a bit to maintain the eyes sharp throughout the entire sequence, which leads to images being slightly soft, hence why the keeper rate is not perfect. For reference, here you can see how much of an improvement the Z8 brings in comparison to the Z7 Mark II, which has an older autofocus system. As much as the Z8 does a commendable job, it is no match for the A1, which delivers a nearly perfect hit rate of 95%. The eye tracking is fantastic, the camera doesn't miss focus on the eyelashes or the nose of the subject as much as the Nikon does. The second test is in poor light conditions and the aim here is to push the performance to the limit. The Nikon gave me a hit rate of 79%, which is good, but when choosing focus priority in the settings, it delivered a lower number of frames because it stopped shooting when it lost the subject completely, resuming only at the very end. With release priority or a mix of focus release priority, the Z8 recorded more photos, but the keeper rate was lower. Again, for reference, the Z7 Mark II did much worse in this condition, basically focusing correctly only in the first few frames and some of the frames at the end of the sequence. The A1 did better, especially because it was able to capture more shots, even with focus priority enabled. As it is often the case, I used the Z8 during a small gig and it did very well with a keeper rate of 90%. What was really impressive to witness during the concert is how sticky the autofocus area was on the subject using 3D tracking with people detection, whether I was zooming in or out or reframing, whether the person was bigger or small on the screen, the autofocus was glued to the face and eyes at all times. The performance is very consistent and only the occasional lack of focus precision stopped the Z8 from being perfect. Since many of you follow me for my birds in flight test, I thought I would talk about this in a separate chapter. The Nikon works really well with birds that are perched on a tree or other natural elements. The detection is instantaneous and focusing on the eye is always very fast and precise. The camera deals with partial obstacles really well. A branch or leaf covering part of the body won't stop it from finding the eye and focus on it, as long as the head remains visible, of course. Another handy feature with the Z8 is when there are multiple subjects in your frame. The auto area mode allows you to switch between the subject using the AF joystick so you can quickly tell the camera which one to prioritize. Then we have birds in flight, as usual at the right kite feeding stations where I test various combinations of settings to find the optimal setup. You can read more about this in my dedicated article on the website, the link is below. The Z8 best autofocus score came at 96%, which is the same I achieved with the Z9, and only two points short of the Sony A1, which remains to this day the best camera I've tested in this specific scenario. A difference of 2% is absolutely irrelevant in a test like this, and it means that the two cameras are on the same level. That said, while analyzing the thousands of images I captured, a few important things came to light. 
The first is about the drive speed. The Z8 delivered the best score at 120 frames per second, which is fantastic, but it also showcased a lack of consistency in performance depending on the drive speed used, as you can see. The main reason for the Z8 struggle is that it can sometimes go for the background rather than the bird, if there are trees or other complex texture behind it. This happened especially at the beginning of the sequence when it needs to lock onto the subject and sometimes tends to prefer what's behind the subject. And this is true especially when the kite was distant, meaning smaller in the frame. The trick is to wait a few seconds to make sure the camera shows a grey rectangle over the bird, which confirms it has detected the subject before engaging the autofocus. If the camera still misfocuses, stopping and pressing the back button focus again forces the Z8 to correct focus more quickly. But this also means that if you suddenly see something and want to take pictures right away, the camera may occasionally fail you. Although, to be fair, it doesn't happen all the time, and I have many sequences that are perfect, but it is something to keep in mind. As for the Sony A1, it just works without any fuss whatsoever. The autofocus is fast, precise, and never misfocuses on the background. The performance is on the same level whether you work at 30 frames per second or 20 frames per second, and the 4% difference in keeper rate is really a no-brainer, also considering the extra images you can save per second. But perhaps the real surprise in this ranking is the Z7 Mark II, which shows that despite being part of an older generation, the autofocus is far from terrible. The important thing with the Z7 Mark II is to choose the right settings, most importantly the 5.5 frames per second drive speed and the wide area mode without animal detection because the camera can recognize birds anyway. Obviously, the continued shooting speed is much lower than the other cameras, but for occasional outings in nature reserves, the Z7 II can do pretty well. The Z8 is capable of 8K and 4K video recording with different formats and codecs to choose from. As you can see, there is a lot of stuff. The quality in 8K is fantastic, very detailed, perhaps a bit too sharp with the standard profile, but you can adjust settings in camera or recall with the analog profile, which delivers a more natural result. In 4K 120p, the Nikon line skips, which means it doesn't use all the pixels and you lose more fine details compared to, for example, the Sony A1, which uses the pixel bidding method instead. Note that the Sony applies a slight sensor crop when recording 4K, 100 or 120p. In 4K, 60p and 30p, the Z8 can record with oversampling, which gives you the best quality, and in this specific case, it looks better than the Sony A1, which still uses the pixel bidding solution. To record the best latitude from the sensor, you can use N-Log on the Z8, which is pretty good, but when compared to the A1 again, the Sony is stronger in the highlights. One nice feature about the Z8 is that you can record a RAW video internally. You have N-RAW, which is actually your only option if you want 8K 50 or 60p. In 4K 60p and below, you can also record in ProRes RAW. Note that with N-RAW, the in-camera lens distortion correction is disabled. You'll need a fast CFexpress Type B card to record raw video, and what's interesting is that out of the two cards I had with me, only the Lexar Professional Diamond worked with NRAW. With the SanDisk Extreme Pro, the camera stopped after a few seconds. Next, we have a comparison at high ISO, and overall the A1 displays a bit more noise. To the Nikon's aid is the fact that you can set the noise reduction to three levels, unlike the Sony, and the standard setting does help.
The Z8 can go up to 102,400 ISO, but obviously the quality decreases. The autofocus works well on the Z8, but there are a few differences to point out. With subject detection and eye tracking for humans, the camera is flawless in 8K just like the Sony A1 is, but the Z8 struggles a bit more in 4K 120p compared to the E-mount model. In low light, however, the Sony is slower in tracking the subject from start to finish. Rolling shutter is not as impressive as with photos, but remains class leading nonetheless. The A1 exhibits slightly more distortion when panning very quickly, but it's a small difference. Finally, these are the results of my overheating test, where I let the cameras record continuously for as long as the battery lasted. In 4K 25p, neither encountered any problem. In 8K 25p, the Z8 managed about 105 minutes, a warning appeared after the first 25 minutes, and it was about the card becoming hot. A further 27 minutes later, temperature warning appeared, but the camera didn't stop. The Sony A1 managed just over an hour in 8K before the camera shut down because of too high internal temperature. The warning on the display appeared 56 minutes in. Ok, time to conclude the video, but first, here is the price of the Nikon Z8 and how it compares to other cameras. I also wanted to mention image stabilization briefly, so photos taken handheld at half a second or even one second of shutter speed are possible, although you better take multiple shots to ensure you get at least one image that is sharp. For video, sensor stabilization alone is disappointing when walking. The result improves if you activate electronic stabilization, but the footage is ruined by a large amount of unpleasant motion blur. Okay, so now the conclusion. The Z8 is a smaller, more affordable version of the flagship Z9, and what I like about these two cameras is that they show just how big of a step Nikon has made to come back at the front of the game and play on an even field with Sony and Canon. And this is my personal opinion, of course, but I really think the Z8 is one of the best mirrorless cameras ever made, one of the best I ever tested for sure. 
the ergonomics are second to none, the autofocus is now a serious feature to talk about, the image quality is, is excellent, the drive speed is stunning, and then you have the impressive video performance. It's not perfect, of course. For example, I find the menu organization a bit confusing at times, and there are a few other flaws or features that are missing, but I think most of the negatives are small things you can live with. And I've mentioned the Sony A1 quite a lot in this video, and one area where the Sony remains king is autofocus. The speed, the precision, the keeper rate is just flawless, really, especially for photography. Another advantage with Nikon are firmware updates, and this is an area where Sony has a bad track record at the moment. Nikon has done a great job with the first generation Z6 and Z7, and a superb job with the Z9. I hope they'll continue with the Z8 as well. For example, Nikon recently implemented the high resolution shot for the first time on the ZF, so I hope they will bring that function to the Z8 later on. All right, that's it then. Thank you very much for watching, as always. If you're interested, you can subscribe to my newsletter. The link is available in the description. Please feel free to leave your questions and comments below. I'm always happy to answer them. And please remember to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Until next time, take care and goodbye.